Born and bred in New York City and Manhattan, public schools. PS6, High School of Music and Art. Well, I have a cousin who lives in Los Angeles, who the family has always considered a conspiracy theorist. And as such, we've always taken whatever he said with a grain of salt, including the prediction he made uh, eight years before it happened that 9-11 um, would happen. And I was sleeping uh, in my bed in Manhattan at, uh, I guess it was about 20 minutes to nine when my phone rang. And because I was a, an actor, that's still early in the morning. <laughs> I was a working actor, so it was early in the morning. But it was my cousin on the other end of the line, and he said, uh, well, they did it. And I said, what are you talking about? And he proceeded to describe what had just happened. And I turned on the television set and joined the rest of the country at this terrible moment. Well, it was a Tuesday, and um, we had a performance on Tuesday night, which was canceled, as was, uh, I think, all of the shows. And uh, Wednesday was canceled as well, which was a two-show day. So we didn't come back into the theater until Thursday night. And uh, that was a very emotional reunion, because uh, here was this family that all backstage becomes when a show runs for a couple of months or a year and people are very close and they share six days a week with each other they share birthdays they share holidays they share life and it's a very close-knit group of people with different abilities who all come together because this is what they chose to do with their lives so it was very meaningful to come back on Thursday as I'm sure it was in every theater and see the people who were your now nearest and dearest, in a sense, uh, going through this terrible, uh, uncertain uh, time. So uh, we, we had gone, we went from 1,200 people in the house, uh, which was what it was on the Sunday matinee, the day before the Tuesday morning bombing. And uh, then we were uh, suddenly down to 200 people on Tuesday night. And it stayed around 200, 300 people for a good uh, week or two, easily. Gradually it started to climb back, but it took, it took months. And the most phenomenal thing about it was that outside the theater, every night, for the first month, were groups of people who'd rented buses from Pennsylvania, from New Hampshire, who'd never been to a Broadway play or show in their lives. But they were uh, trying to do what uh, Mayor Giuliani had asked them to do, which was to come and save the, the New York. Yes. And so outside the theater, it was like Bedford Falls. It was like something out of a Frank Capra picture. All these people standing there to say thank you to the cast as we left the stage, as we left the theater every night. And uh, I'd never experienced anything like that before, and probably, hopefully, never will again. Well, the only I, I, I was thinking about it uh, today, of course, because I knew you'd be asking me questions about it, and I, I, I remember very vividly the expressions of people on the street during the day, New Yorkers, people going to and from work, and that was very different. It was definitely, uh, we were under siege, and we didn't know what was happening next. We didn't know if this was the end of it or the beginning of it. There was an anthrax scare going on at the same time. So you literally didn't know if you'd be able to, to take your next breath. Uh, and that created a, uh, a tremendous unity in the city. I mean, people looked at each other differently and they knew they were in a different reality than any that we'd ever known who'd lived here all our lives. And that was, in, uh, that was apparent in everybody's face for weeks afterwards, not to mention the smell in the air, which was, was there. And when the wind shifted, uh, some days it was, it was pretty uh, unbearable. So it was a very uh, unique uh, period. Audiences that are small are less responsive than audiences that are large because they're frightened to display themselves. So they uh, tuck themselves in. 
They don't want to be the first one to laugh, perhaps in the wrong place, or perhaps um, inappropriately uh, in some way or other. So it's much harder to play to a small house than it is to a large house where people are anonymous and they can laugh and not feel as if they're going to be singled out. But if you've got 200 people spread over uh, 800 seats, everybody feels conspicuous, so they laughed less. But I, I think I speak for other actors when I say that that, that doesn't affect uh, our performance. There are too many other things uh, that have to be right to give you the luxury of thinking about any of those things while you're out there. You go out there the same way you're going out there whether there are uh, 2,000 people in the house or 200 in the house. You're into your performance and what you've distilled it to be. And that's what you do. You don't think about that other stuff. Before you come on, after you come off, you can think about it. When you're out there, you're only thinking about the things you're supposed to think about, because otherwise you'll uh, louse up your other actor who's looking for you for reality, and you're looking to them. So that, that, that doesn't um, affect it. Well, we didn't know who was out front. We were grateful that there was anybody out front. And... Um, I was very lucky in my life because I went to Northwestern University with uh, a lot of other uh, successful actors and actresses who did very well after they got out of there and before I came there. But we had a great acting teacher who taught us that uh, the theater was the last great chance to save the world, that there was uh, nothing like theater, uh, not even going to church although the theater preceded the church in human history, and that it was born out of a need to be together and answer unanswerable questions. Why did it, why were there earthquakes? Why were there storms? Why did the crops fail this year? Why death? Why everything? And she believed that the theater gave people a chance to share that reality because they were all together in one place experiencing something happening on stage that uh, they would all have their own reactions to, but that they would share with other people watching it as well. And that's what happened to Broadway. It died. For weeks there was nothing. This was a ghost town around here. You could walk home at night and you didn't see a soul. Times Square for weeks. And gradually, those crowds outside who forced themselves to come here to support this industry, the theater, grew. And today, of course, Broadway is thriving and Broadway is important and people want to be together, uh, not just on Broadway, but wherever there are theaters, which is every place in the country. And, uh, it's a unique chance to, uh, to, to be real. Well, they would... The one I'm, uh, that comes to my mind uh, was the one I did, uh, which was the first, was I Love New York. It was I Love New York, and there was a, 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 we filmed it at m m midnight or two in the morning in Times Square, Lucy Arnaz and I, because I had just gone into the company of their playing our song, and that was when they initiated that whole campaign. So um, yeah, that was interesting, to be dr driven around in the middle of Times Square at uh, 2 in the morning and uh, see all of the poor unfortunates who were lying around the place at that time, where there were a lot of police, there was a lot of protection, and we were being driven around on a, uh, some kind of a flatbed truck with a camera crew uh, and a piano on it and singing songs. But that was very different than than the kinds of things that went on after 9-11 to stir up business and to get people back and to show that everybody was together and so on and so forth. So, I guess his, his, uh, his uh, secretary called me, or, or it may have been my agent who called me. I, I can't remember that, uh, but somehow or other I was contacted and the, uh, somebody said there's a seen Woody is making something and he wants you to be in it and we went to Central Park and um, he told me what to say and I don't remember even if it was written down or if he just uh, uh, told it to me and um, I, it wasn't long it wasn't a lot but I got the gist of the joke you know about a, I, I think I played a guy who wanted to get out of New York 
And he said to me, but you're the commissioner of uh, parks, and uh, how can you leave? You can't leave. <laughs> it was funny, and uh, it helped lighten the mood. For the first time in my life, the vulnerability of feeling that you could be murdered and killed and among masses of people who were going to suffer the same uh, fate. And, you know, I grew up in New York City, so I knew it was dangerous to go above 96th Street at certain times, and I, 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 I knew where I was safe and where I wasn't. This was uh, totally different because you didn't think you were safe at all from anything. And that felt like you were in a war zone, which of course is what it was.